Nothing upsets preconceived minds like someone who successfully crosses over to another genre after he's been thoroughly pigeonholed by experts in a previous one. Such was Hank Garland, Nashville's busiest country guitar picker who, with little warning, made a superb jazz album in mid-career and seemed headed for jazz stardom until an auto accident left him unable to perform. As a jazz performer, Garland had a fertile melodic and harmonic imagination and a sound that apparently honed to the gospel of tone and attack according to Charlie Christian. With some Les Paul mixed in and more than a touch of Bud Powell's influence as well, but even on his country records, Garland's urbane jazz and blues sensibilities can be felt. Calpins is a rural suburb of Spartanburg, South Carolina, and while growing up there, Garland absorbed country music from Arthur Guitar Boogie Smith and Mother Maybelle Carter on the radio. Eventually switching from banjo to guitar, he joined the Grand Old Opry at age 15 in 1945, signed with Decca in 1949 as a solo artist, and appeared on innumerable Nashville recording sessions while jamming privately in local clubs. In July 1960, Garland came forward as a jazz musician, organizing a combo that was scheduled to play the Newport Jazz Festival, but found itself on the sidelines after riots closed the festival. The following year, Garland's jazz debut on record, Jazz Winds from a New Direction, astonished both jazz and country circles, and a follow-up album, The Unforgettable Guitar of Hank Garland, was issued. But in September of 1961, a near-fatal auto accident robbed Garland of a good deal of his coordination and memory. He eventually returned to playing, but never regained the renown of his early 60s heyday. And Hank Garland passed away on December 27, 2004, at the age of 74. In the mid 50s, Garland influenced guitar manufacturing when he and Billy Bird helped design what would eventually become the Gibson Birdland hollow body. Some of the specifics Garland and Bird requested included a thinner body and a 23 and a half inch scale. The company kept the first Birdland off the line and Garland got the second instrument. Garland also experimented with different instruments and effects on his recording. For example, he employed an echophonic tape echo on Patsy Cline's smash, I Fall to Pieces. Despite Garland's association with Gibson, he felt no compunction about using other gear to get the right sound. Quote, he borrowed my strat to play on Little Sister with Elvis, unquote, Bradley says. He told me, yours twangs more than mine because he was playing a Gibson. Ultimately, the varying recollections and legends regarding Hank Garland dissipate like mist in the morning sun, because the reality of his mu musical legacy is indisputable. It's on records, it's on tape, it's in the yellowing session pages decaying in Nashville office buildings. You gotta ignore the controversy and the allegations, and just lose track of time while listening to songs like Sugarfoot Rag or Move. In those melodies, the speedy licks, the warm tone, you'll find the measure, the true measure, of Hank Garland. Oh, man. Oh, you go too crazy here. Hey, how about this one? <laughs> Did you know this? Hank Garland stomp. The Hank Garland. Right, <laughs> yes, sir.